Sometimes people ask me what I'm up to, and I say I'm writing a book, which is true. And then to be polite, I'll say, so what's it about? And I say it's about empathy. And when I say empathy, people sometimes smile and nod a little bit. And then I say, I'm against it. <laughs> and then they, they, they kind of laugh nervously. And I've come to realize that being against empathy is like being against world peace or being against kittens. It's a sort of <laughs> view so crazy nobody would hold it. Now, part of the problem is that people mean different things by empathy. So some of you would think I'm, treat the word empathy as referring to goodness, kindness, love, morality, making the world a better place, everything good. Well, I'm not against that. And I'm not against empathy in that sense. Some people use the term empathy uh, in a more narrow sense to refer to understanding the minds of other people, what psychologists sometimes call mind reading or naive psychology. And I'm not against that either. Although I'm not confident that's necessarily a force for good. A good person can do good things by understanding what other how other people work, what gives them pain, what gives them pleasure. So can a sadist or a monster. It's kind of an amoral property. What I mean by empathy, what I'm going to argue against, is the way many philosophers and psychologists use the term to talk about putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing the world through their eyes, feeling their pain, feeling their pleasure. Um, now, psychologists have long been interested in this. Neuroscientists, for instance, have recently discovered that there's a sense in which we literally feel other people's pain. If I watch you being poked in the hand, parts of my brain that are active when I'm poked in the hand will then become active. I literally feel your pain. And Andy Meltzoff gave a wonderful talk yesterday finding the same effect in babies. And psychologists like Dan Batson have found that, that if you feel empathy for another person, you, you, you put yourself in their shoes, you feel their pain, um, you're more likely to help them. You're more likely to care for them. And this is why many people are, are very pro-empathy. And certainly many people in the general public are pro-empathy. Uh, Barack Obama has spoken many times about the importance of empathy, recently saying that the biggest deficit we have in America is not a financial one, it's an empathy deficit. So what's not to like? Well, empathy serves as a spotlight, zooming you in on, on people and specific people and specific problems. And that can be a good thing, but that's also its weakness. Because of its focusing properties, it can be enumerate, parochial, bigoted. And we see this in the lab. So you could do an experiment where you ask people to feel empathy for a single person, show her face, give her name, and you find that people will then be very engaged and want to help that person. Then you give another group tell them about eight different people. Well, it's hard to feel empathy for eight different people. And people actually give less to the eight than to the one. We also find in the lab that empathy is very biased. Um, it's true what I told you about the hand thing. But it works best for somebody like me if the hand is white. If it's a black hand, I feel less empathy. We feel less empathy from people who are described as being from the elk group in other countries, other ethnicities. Um, a European study found that people feel a lot of empathy for, for those who are fans of the same soccer team. No empathy at all for fans of different soccer teams. <laughs> and the same, the same narrowness, the same focus shows up in the real world. It's because of the sort of zooming effect of empathy that the whole world cares more about a little girl stuck in a well than they do about the, the possible deaths of millions and billions due to climate change. Because of empathy, that when a teenage white girl was lost in Aruba, there was about 20 times more television coverage of that event than of the deaths of tens of thousands of people in the Sudan. It's because of empathy that if, if somebody gets sick from a virus, they'll shut down the virus program, because it's easy to get empathized with somebody who's suffering. Um, even if the virus program happens to be saving the lives of dozens and or perhaps hundreds of people. Now, these are all examples of cases where empathy is, in some way, doing good but not doing the right sort of good. But actually, empathy could also do bad. And it's not hard to think of examples. Um, many people have pointed out, for instance, that when we give to child beggars in Africa and India, we're making the world worse. We're supporting a criminal organization that kidnaps and often maims tens of thousands of children. If you want to help the children there, there's a lot of better ways to do it, like giving to Oxfam. But giving to Oxfam does not hit our empathetic buttons. It does not give us this warm rush of satisfaction. Um, think about atrocities, like the lynchings of, of, of American blacks in the South, 
or the European Holocaust. And when we talk about them as psychologists, we talk about them in terms of, of, uh, of prejudice and hatred. But it's often been pointed out that empathy plays a huge role. These atrocities are typically motivated by stories of suffering victims, stories of white women assaulted by blacks, stories of, uh, of German children attacked by Jewish pedophiles. When some people think about empathy, they think about charity. I think about war. Whenever a democratic country goes to war, like the United States, what they'll do is they'll tell stories about the suffering victims uh, that need to be saved through the war. Before he went to war in Iraq, there were stories about the atrocities committed by Saddam Hussein and his brutal children. Um, when we go to war against ISIS, as that escalates, we'll hear more and more stories about the atrocities uh, done by ISIS. Now, to some extent, this is a good argument. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. There are sometimes good reasons to go to war. But the obsessive focus on, on the victims can easily be exploited and can easily be made to support a war in which, will, will, which causes suffering many, many, many times more than the suffering of the victims. We did some studies, my colleagues and, my, and, and me at Yale, um, where we measured people's empathy on a standard empathy scale. And then we, we asked them how, much they, how violently they would punish somebody who did something wrong to an innocent victim. We did this around five different scenarios, both international and domestic. And what we found was the more empathy you have, the more violent you are, the more ready and willing you are to cause pain. Because your empathy motivates your anger. It motivates your rage. Now, all of this so far is policy. And you might be thinking, empathy, you might agree with me, empathy might be a poor guide to policy. But in our everyday lives with the people we care for, the people we're intimate with, empathy is critical. But that's not what the data shows. There's been now hundreds of studies testing how empathic people are. And despite what many people might think, the more empathy you have has very little correlation, often no correlation, with how kind you are, how much you give to charity, how likely you are to volunteer. A recent meta-analysis combined hundreds of studies looking at the opposite direction, looking at aggression, physical aggression, verbal aggression, and sexual aggression, and found absolutely no connection with empathy. Or think about the helping professions. We often say to one another, doctors and therapists should be empathic. And if what you mean by empathic is caring and kind and understanding, absolutely. But if what you mean by empathic is they should put themselves into our shoes, they should feel what we feel, definitely not. This sort of empathic engagement leads to burnout. It leads to suffering and pain. It also makes them bad at what they do. When I'm with my therapist, I want her to, to understand me. I'm complicated. I want her, um, and I want her to want to make me better. I want her to care for me. But I don't want her to feel my pain. If I'm going on, I'm anxious and I'm depressed, I don't want her to go, I'm anxious and I'm depressed. <laughs> I really want her calm and caring. And, this sort of, and I'm making the distinction casually, but there's research supporting this, and Richie's going to go and expand on this, I, I think, in different directions, disentangling empathy from compassion. There's a wonderful collaboration between Tanya Singer, a neuroscientist, and Matthew Ricard, uh, a Buddhist monk and biologist, where among many other studies, what they did was they trained people to feel empathy, to, to engage in empathic contact with other people. Then they trained another group to be compassionate, to care about other people, but not necessarily engage in the same way. What they found was the empathic group had a worse time, they suffered more, and they helped less. The compassionate group felt good, they loved it, they enjoyed it, and they helped more. So this, this leads, and this is how I'll end, it answers a sort of skeptical question, which is, if you took away empathy, what you, would you replace it with? And I think we'd replace it with two things. One is a sort of rather cold-blooded, rational cost-benefit analysis. Suppose what you really care about is trying to make the world a better place. Then you would sort of go not after what gives you the buzz, but what really helps other people. And then the second thing is we need some sort of emotional push. But the push need not come from empathy. The push can come from love, from caring, from compassion, from more distanced emotions that don't swallow us up in the suffering of others. So I've hoped to persuade you that, uh, to uh, join me in the crusade against empathy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Uh, let me begin by just sharing with you uh, a little bit of my journey uh, as Paul and others mentioned, uh, Trish mentioned, I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I've been very interested in the 
diversity among people in how we respond to life's slings and arrows. And I've been particularly interested in how we can help those who are more vulnerable to our uh, challenges that we face on a daily basis to help them uh, respond to those challenges in ways that are more adaptive and more effective. And uh, I have been doing research along those lines for many years, mostly focusing on the negative side of life, mostly focusing on how adversity affects the brain, focusing on disorders like depression and anxiety. And then in 1992, I had the great fortune of being invited by His Holiness the Dalai Lama to meet with him at his residence in Dharamsala, India. And the Dalai Lama was interested in encouraging research on the minds and brains of Tibetan monks like Matthew Ricard, who Paul mentioned, uh, who have spent years cultivating certain positive attributes of mind. And on that day in 1992, the Dalai Lama challenged me and he said, look, you've been using tools of modern neuroscience to study anxiety and depression and fear. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And that was really the beginning of this journey. And uh, after that momentous meeting, we uh, changed the course of our research and in many ways changed the course, I changed the course of my life to orient much more in this direction. And in 2009, we uh, established a center at the University of Wisconsin called the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, where we do this work. Now, at the end of his talk, Paul uh, brought up the distinction between empathy and compassion and mentioned this unusual collaboration uh, between uh, Tanya Singer, who is a social neuroscientist, and Mathieu Ricard, who is a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Uh, and I should also mention that Mathieu Ricard is an unusual Tibetan Buddhist monk. Uh, first of all, he's French by nationality. He's been a Buddhist monk since 1967. And he also has a PhD in molecular biology uh, from the Pasteur Institute, where he worked with Francois Jacob, the Nobel laureate. Uh, and so he comes to the table with really remarkable credentials. When Mathieu went to the Himalayas to uh, become a Buddhist monk, he never envisioned that his life would actually return full circle to the scientific laboratory. And the very first scientific experiment he participated in was actually in our lab in 2001. And it preceded a meeting that we were holding with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Madison uh, in 2001. And uh, we recorded brain activity for Mathieu for the very first time when he was engaged in a very specific kind of contemplative practice. And in his own words, what he and other practitioners were doing during this practice is that they were filling their whole minds with nothing other than feelings of love and compassion non-referentially toward all beings. Now, when I talk about this research, I sometimes say that you know how those, there are those commercials uh, on television that say in fine print, don't try this at home? <laughs> well, I would encourage you, please do try this at home. But don't be frustrated if your mind is filled with all kinds of discursive thoughts that uh, uh, in one way or another distract you from this main practice. According to these long-term practitioners like Mathieu, who spent years, and in the research that we did, they spent an average of 34,000 hours of practice. You can go do the arithmetic at home. 34,000 hours is a big number. Uh, and they've spent a lot of time engaged in these kinds of practices, which very much are other focused, focused on uh, the, um, the disposition to relieve the suffering of others. Now, one of the things that we observed uh, in, in these initial findings from uh, Mathieu and other practitioners when they were generating uh, these feelings of compassion is that in addition to areas in the brain that are associated with positive emotion being activated, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, uh, what we also saw unexpectedly is that motor 
regions of the brain were activated. And it's quite interesting when we talk to them about this finding uh, after the experiments were conducted and explained uh, what circuits were activated and explained that these were motor circuits, even though they were perfectly still when they were engaged in these practices, um, they instantaneously connected to this and thought, these practices of compassion are practices which are basically practices that teach us to be utterly prepared to act when suffering is encountered. If there is an action that could be taken that would help to relieve suffering, what they regard is that their practices are practices that will help them to engage in that action uh, when suffering is encountered. It's very different than the kind of empathic state that Paul was describing where if you observed a person who is genuinely in pain or genuinely anxious and you were empathic, you were putting yourself in that other person's shoes and experiencing what they were experiencing, it would actually impair your ability to act rather than facilitate your ability to act. And so compassion really is uh, a, uh, uh, a mental state which is very, very different in, uh, in terms of its neural correlates and also different in terms of its, uh, its sequela, in terms of the consequences of that mental state. Now in the laboratory, we have been documenting the changes in the brain but we've also been really interested in taking this work out of the laboratory and bringing it to real people in real context. And one of the things that we're particularly interested in uh, is research in neuroscience as well as behavioral science that indicates that there are certain sensitive periods in development where the brain is particularly susceptible to being influenced and there is potential to cultivate certain habits of mind perhaps uh, in a way which is easier, perhaps in ways which can endure uh, much more um, easily than if they're taught at an older age. And so we've developed a curriculum for preschool children that we call the kindness curriculum. And this is a curriculum that is now being implemented in public school settings. And we've just published the first serious scientific study evaluating the impact of the kindness curriculum. And we evaluated it like you would evaluate a pharmaceutical in, random, in a randomized controlled trial where we randomized children by classroom and we exposed them in this classroom to this curriculum for 12 weeks. And it, it's a curriculum that emphasizes not empathy, but emphasizes these elements of compassion. That is um, recognizing suffering and then acting in response to it in ways which are intended to help relieve the suffering of those who are um, showing that kind of emotion. And uh, what we have observed is we, we've developed a measure for kids that is um, age appropriate for four and five year olds. And the way we did this is we gave kids an important currency, a currency which is valued at that age which for these particular kids um, was stickers. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you who can remember the time when you had young children, um, stickers really at that age is an important currency. And what we did is we simply had kids distribute stickers into different envelopes, one envelope for themselves and another envelope for uh, a kid in their classroom who may be their best friend in one case or in another case, it may be a picture of their least favorite friend. Or in another case, it may be a picture of a child they've never seen before. Or in another case, it may be for a picture of an obviously sick looking child. And the bottom line is that we found that we can actually increase kids' generosity. We can increase their propensity for this kind of altruistic behavior through this kind of simple training. And this has led us to the view that compassion and kindness are really best thought of in the same way that we think of language. We all come into the world with an innate capacity for language. 
And we know from case studies that have been done of feral children who are raised in the wild that if we don't have a normal linguistic community in which a child is raised, that propensity for language is not nurtured and does not get expressed in a normal way. I think the same thing is true for kindness and compassion. My view is that we're all born with an innate capacity for kindness and for compassion. We need, however, the proper environment. We need the proper uh, social conditions. We need the proper parenting in order for that propensity to be realized. And so if we can figure out ways to complement whatever a child gets at home uh, to encourage that kind of uh, behavior in young children, uh, the consequences really can be enormous, particularly when children develop uh, over the course of time. And so these are effects that actually are multiplicative uh, as a child develops. So uh, we think that compassion and kindness should really best be regarded ultimately as skills. And what, let me just come back and end with some neuroscientific findings that I alluded to earlier. We've been very interested in what the constituents of well-being are from a neuroscientific perspective. And one of the constituents of well-being that has been uh, documented neuroscientifically in ways that are compelling is that when individuals engage in generous, altruistic, compassionate acts toward others, it actually activates circuits in the brain that are important for positive affect. We don't see these circuits activated when a person is showing empathy for another person who is suffering. These circuits are actually circuits that are intrinsically rewarding. And so uh, the Dalai Lama is frequently saying that the best ingredient for cultivating happiness is to be generous to others. And the neuroscientific data is really bearing that out. Generosity is one of the ways that we can find that activates these circuits in the brain that can lead to uh, sustained well-being, a kind of well-being that is enduring. So thank you all for being so attentive. And we'll now ask each other thank a few you. questions. So that's a lovely talk on lovely work, and, and you can see why we'd be pleased with each other's talks. Um, <laughs> I really feel his, uh, his anyway, empathy humor. Um, uh, so so, so let, let's push at this a bit. So here's an objection I often get, and I want to kind of put it back to you, which is I'm, I'm putting down empathy, which is clearly an intimate connection, and people love it because of its intimacy, instead favoring more rational and, and, and distant processes. And people don't like this. People often object. They say, um, they say, but I like feeling what other people feel. It's your idea of going to Oxfam and figuring out what causes the most difference and, and loving all the people on earth. That just doesn't seem right. It, seemed, it seems kind of cold. And, and, I, and I wonder whether the same objection comes to you and how you'd respond to it. Like, so, so from the Buddhist tradition, um, there's, the, there's the famous joke about the Buddhist vacuum cleaner, which comes with no attachments. And so, so, you know, how, how would you respond to that concern? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And, uh, uh, and let me just also preface this by saying, uh, by expressing my gratitude to you for uh, the lens that you've brought to understanding empathy. It's really an important one, and uh, it needs to be heard. So I really appreciate it. And you're doing it in a way which is really getting traction. Um, so in terms of this objection, there's a difference between uh, not being attached to outcomes and uh, um, having strong aspirations. Uh, we can still have strong aspirations. If they're not realized for some reason, they won't knock us out of shape. Uh, they won't derail us. Uh, but we can still have those strong aspirations for which we're willing to put a lot of effort into. Uh, I, you know, the Dalai Lama is a great example of someone who has very strong aspirations for the Tibetan people, for world peace, 
uh, all kinds of strong aspirations, and he works indefatigably for those aspirations, and uh, yet I think he's pretty unattached to the outcome. Uh, and so I think that um, my view is that the cold cognitive calculus is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, I think we do need this emotional compassion. Uh, I think we need it really badly. Uh, and I think that the, the rational analysis is critical, but I think it, it, it's necessary, but in itself it's not sufficient. So, so let, me, let me respond to that, because this, this may be a point of tension, and we can maybe make things a bit interesting. Um, so Adam Smith, hundreds of years ago, gave the ex famous example of a European man hearing about thousands of people dying in a faraway land. He said, the man would say, well, that's a shame. And then compare it to the man hearing that the next day he was going to lose his little finger. He'd be saying, it's horrible, worst thing in the world. And he's capturing our everyday psychology. Imagine you all what it'd be like to hear you're going to lose your little finger tomorrow. And then imagine opening up a web browser and hearing that hundreds died in a country you've never heard of. I guarantee you, the web browser news will, will not upset you. If it did upset you, you wouldn't be in good enough psychological shape to make it in a room, because people always die. So Smith has this observation about our feelings. But he says, nonetheless, he says, we can care about the hundreds of people. We wouldn't choose our finger over their lives. And he said, how do we do it? He said, it's not feeling. It's not this soft spark of sentiment that nature has instilled into our hearts. Rather, it's sort of reasonable deliberations, an appreciation that their life is worth more, is worth the same as ours. And more recently, Peter Singer, who's a famous utilitarian, has argued for effective altruism and argued that effective altruists who, who actually work, give an enormous amount of money and an enormous amount of time to help others, are actually not motivated by deep feeling, but motivated by sort of an intellectual concern. How could I live a, a wonderful life if others are suffering? Well, I think that um, you know, those are uh, important questions. I think that it remains to be seen to, the, to what extent uh, if, if one is able, in the Peter Singer case, to uh, use effective altruism and uh, engage in rational acts which may help others, uh, uh, it, it remains to be seen to what extent circuits in the brain that are actually associated with uh, feelings of well-being, with positive affect, uh, are activated. My conjecture is that they actually would be. I think that mm -hmm. affect uh, is everywhere. Affect, there's no such thing as a cold cognitive calculus. Uh, I think that's a complete myth. Uh, I think that when one is actually engaged in a serious way where one is really working toward the benefit of others in that sense, there are going to be some affect, there's going to be some affective component which I think is important in sustaining the level of commitment that may be necessary to engage in that kind of strategy. I think we see that in major world leaders who, um, uh, uh, who uh, uh, have um, uh, made a difference. People like uh, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, uh, where there has been a very strong emotional connection. Uh, and I think it comes from um, uh, not from empathy in the sense that you're describing it, but really more from compassion, but the emotional side of compassion, which I think is, is essential. I agree with a lot of that. I, would, I agree that some effective component is necessary for everything. I'm less confident in you that it has to be compassion or, or something like that. I think with Martin Luther King, for instance, it was often anger, anger at injustice. Um, with many world leaders, um, it's, it's a desire to, to, an abstract desire to, to preserve one's place in the world, abstract values. Um, for Smith, he says, the motivating force is a desire to be a good person, a desire to be able to look yourself in the mirror, as it were, and, and see you're, you're a decent person. Well, one of the distinctions that you know well, Paul, that we as psychologists and neuroscientists make is the distinction between declarative knowledge and procedural mm -hmm. knowledge. Declarative knowledge is knowing about stuff. Uh, we can know that it's important to, uh, to be good and to be uh, altruistic and to do the kind of cold cognitive analysis that you're talking about. That is very different than procedural knowledge, mm -hmm. which is embodied knowledge, uh, where we uh, are really embodying, embodying those characteristics. And I think that 
we need both declarative and procedural knowledge. And I don't think that you get procedural knowledge from a kind of cold analysis. Uh, I think you get procedural knowledge through practice. And the practice that I think is important is diminishing self-cherishing, which yeah. is at the heart of compassion, uh, which is absolutely essential. And, uh, uh, and then um, uh, understanding the suffering of others and where yeah. action may be effective. I love that. The in that. We may disagree on edges, but the idea of valuing yourself less is so critical to being a good person. And, and, and sometimes... Yeah, and I was going to say, and, value, and I think that you can't, you can't go to class and learn how to value yourself less. Just can't do that. Um, you got to practice. And it takes work. It takes systematic work uh, to enable that to occur. But still, the lesson of Smith, I think, is that you could care so much more about this, and yet, because of your commitments, because of your knowledge, do that. There was a conversation yesterday which had a lot of social, in, in one of from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock yesterday, had a lot of social activists and talking about these great changes in the world. It was a beautiful, wonderful, moving talk. And then the final question was, somebody asked them, what would you die for? And, and I answered that in my head, and you could answer that in your head. And, what, what, and people's answers varied, but people didn't say, I would die for the cause which I've been working for. I would die for, so that there'd be equality. Says, most of them answered, for my children. And, and I, I love that, because it shows that, that these things are not gonna go away. We're not gonna love ourselves less than a stranger. We're not, I'm not gonna love my children less, I'm always gonna love my children more than I'm gonna love your children. But we can know that, and still act and understand that your children matter as much as my children, as do the children of people thousands of miles away who I'll never know. And I, I, and I think that one of the um, great, um, one of the things I'm really especially grateful for in, in our own work is that we've gotten to meet people like the Dalai Lama as part of our work who have engaged in, in these practices in a very systematic way uh, to be, I think, exemplars. And I, I believe that for someone like the Dalai Lama, um, it doesn't matter. It, 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 he does not value his brother more than he values another person. Um, they, because of, and I think that we're now talking about the further reaches of human plasticity. Uh, and I, um, I think that seeing it in, a, in an exemplar case of that sort is so powerful and palpable that it, it expands our notions of what it is possible to be human. So I'm normally the most radical person on stage when I'm, I'm attacking empathy, but, but, but that was a very radical claim. Do you think what we should aspire, aspire to morally, though we may never reach it, is that, is not loving your brother more than anybody else, not caring for your child more than anybody else? I don't know. You know, I, um, I don't want to take a hard stand on that. I, I am inspired by um, those exemplars, and I think that uh, it represents uh, something quite extraordinary. I think it's probably out of reach of most of us, um, but the very fact that I think that there are those beings that do exist on this planet, to me, is an important statement about what is possible. It, and I'm not convinced that it, the world would be a better place if we all were like that. But I think the world needs exemplars like that. And we're fortunate to have some. It's an interesting claim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily, if somebody came up to me and said, they don't love their children any more than they love anybody else, I don't know if I'd admire such a person. Uh -huh. I mean, the Dalai Lama doesn't have children. And, yeah. <laughs> that may help. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> not, 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 not married either, I gather. Should we? Um, sure, we should can we open turn this, it open, this up? open for the. Do you want to? Keith. Well, we're, we're having microphones that are being sent around, so. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Keith Bronstein. This is great, really great. I've, I've enjoyed this so much. So to get to a very practical, current 
thing that has been talked about and has been talked about here in Aspen during the sessions. Uh, this horrible catastrophe occurred in South Carolina. And the whole nation has responded in some way to it. I saw Lindsey Graham speak the other day, and he talked about how it changed him and changed South Carolina. I'm a former Chicagoan. I still have children who live there. This event occurs in Chicago on almost a weekly basis, almost weekly, 52 weeks a year. There's no response. I understand the police on the street and the civil authorities who are cl very close to this and intimate to it try to deal with it. And I congratulate them and, and, and admire them for trying to deal with it. But where is the public resonance to this weekly occurrence in Chicago versus how we're talking about this here, compassion, empathy, the whole nation felt that. We feel that something has occurred. The stars and bars is gone forever as it should have been a long time ago. And yet in Chicago, this weekend, sadly, Charleston will occur. And it won't resonate with anyone. Um, I, I think that's a wonderful point, And it resonates very much to what we've been saying. I think mass shootings are the baby in the well. I think mass shootings illustrate are the irrationality and the misplaced priorities that empathy leads us to. Mass shootings, like in Charleston or Sandy Hook, are atrocities, are absolutely horrible. But since 1980, by generous estimates, 600 Americans have died from mass shootings. This is 0.01% of the homicide deaths in America. More people die in Chicago each year, than in the, more children than in the Sandy Hook massacre. What this means, for instance, is if you could snap your fingers and make it so that America will never have a mass shooting again, no one will ever know you did that when, it, when you look at the murder rate because it is so statistically insignificant. Now, we have to work with the psychology we have. These sort of things capture our attention. Certain things like a terrorist attack that kills five will, will, will bother us limitlessly more than food poisoning which kills 500. That's just the way that we work. But I think we should aspire not to work that way. I think we should aspire so that the color of the victims, that, the, that how they die, that these weird quirks don't matter to us as much. If you really believe every life is equal, you should be, be far more concerned about Chicago and far less concerned about freak anomalies. Now, I think uh, just to add a different piece to that, which I completely agree with, um, I think in response to these tragedies that we see uh, and the tragedies that lurk in the background that are not so salient for both of them, um, a, a typical response, I think, is helplessness. We just don't know um, how the, the problems are so complicated. Where, where is going to be a road in? Uh, and the, the, the information that we get uh, about it is, is so negative. Uh, these things are just occurring all the time. And in many ways, it's similar to the environmental movement, where the data are so um, uh, are compelling, but they're so devastating and uh, uh, upsetting. And it's not clear uh, what the ordinary person could or should do. And one of the things that um, I often reflect on, and this was um, something pointed out to, uh, to a number of us who were at a meeting uh, uh, on the environment with the Dalai Lama uh, a couple of years ago, and that is that we also need a positive message. We need something that we can aspire to that's accessible to all of us that may, in the long run at least, produce some benefit. Um, when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech, it, the title of the speech was not, I have a nightmare. Uh, and I think that having the positive vision is really something important. And uh, I think that uh, we need to accompany uh, this information with a, a kind of positive vision that we can, that's accessible to each of us. And that's where I think this, the message of compassion, of you know, the number of random kind acts that are actually engaged in by Americans every day far exceeds the murder rate in Chicago. 
And we don't pay any attention to that. And I think we need to figure out ways to start paying attention to that. I don't think I'm on. Oh, OK, I'm on. Um, I actually come to this from a different perspective. I'm a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist. And uh, one of the things that I noticed as you were talking about empathy, as you're talking about compassion, rationality, irrationality, is where do the ideas around attachment, your attachment to others, attachment theory, how we attach to each other, um, influence uh, how we begin to develop, whether we develop empathy, whether we develop compassion. Um, you know, one can have a lot of empathy and be a sociopath. Um, and uh, one can have a lot of compassion and be a narcissist. Um, but um, I'm wondering if any of your research is, extends to some of the ideas about attachment and looking at whether people who are more securely attached may be more able to be compassionate and caring versus people who are more insecurely attached. I'm, I'm just curious where you go with all of that. Um, <laughs> Paul's the developmental expert. This, which makes it extremely embarrassing to say I don't know. Um, it's, it, it, it's a very good question. As, as a developmental psychologist, I do research uh, with, with young babies, actually, in collaboration with my wife, Karen Wynn, who presented a couple of days ago. And one thing we're interested in is, is the kindness of babies. Um, we call it compassion or altruism or what you will. And we're interested in universals, what shows up in every normal human being. But we see differences. Now, we know from a lot of work in behavioral genetics that some of these differences have to do with the genetic toss of the dice. People always roughly say 50% of the variation, and that's probably true, but where's the other 50%? And I'd be sympathetic to the idea that the other 50% has to do to some extent with how somebody is raised and how someone interacts with a, in attachment. Some, certainly, there's huge emphasis on parents and children, but some psychologists and some psychoanalysts have focused on later life attachments as well. And I, I think that it has a powerful pull. I'd like to think that the sort of thing that Richie is talking about and that we're sort of, as to how to make people become better people and more moral people, would to some extent involve transcending that. Involve transcending the accidents of one's particular history, often the misfortunes of one, one's particular history, and taking a broader view that's, that's more distant and less wrapped up in oneself. I actually think that, that often good therapy is, is, is helps one uh, establish that amount of distance. And so I think that's a really interesting issue. Um, the, yeah. I'm here. Hi. Paul. <laughs> um, Paul, when you were talking about the uh, looking at someone's hand, experiencing pain, uh, makes me think of David Eagleman's work. Um, and uh, what he also was able to discover is that it only takes an instant for someone to identify with a group and then feel their pain. Um, you can talk maybe a little bit about that. But the thing that you made me wonder now that I never thought about is that that kind of empathy maybe is something that reifies a narrow sense of self, while compassion may be a diminishing of a narrow sense of self. Is that something that you've looked at? So you, you're, and, and, and I think Richie's going to want to weigh in on this as well. Um, you, that raises a lot of questions. I'll just take the final part, which I think is very good. Many people pointed out that empathic engagement can motivate a selfish capturing of self. I see you in, ter I see you in terrible pain, a, a personal loss, a, a, a painful illness. I now feel this pain, being empathic. But now I have two problems. I have you, but I have me. I'm in pain, and I've got to work on my, on my pain. Um, there are studies of animals. There are studies of, of, of rats who they see another rat in anguish. It bothers them so much that they start rocking and self-grooming. And I think we see the same thing in people, where your pain is so much that it bothers me. And, and feeling my empathy for me, A, makes me want to take care of myself, and B, just wants me to run away. Um, I'm, I think, I'm a, to the extent I'm a highly empathic person, it makes me a worse person. Because I see suffering, and I just can't take it. Well, somebody who's more compassionate and less empathic would, would love, would, would want to care for you, want to make you better, but do so with all the positive affect that Richie finds in his research, without swallowing up the anguish. Yeah, and I, in terms of the, your question about um, self-cherishing and self-focus, one of the really interesting things that we see is that there are networks in the brain 
that are associated with a kind of self-narrative that is going on all the time. Uh, when we just pause and interrogate our own mind, even very briefly, a lot of our uh, mind wandering and rumination turns out to be quite self-focused. Uh, we're worrying about the future, we're ruminating about the past, and it's all in relation to me. Uh, and when we experience pain, it's not that we're experiencing the sensations, it's my pain. Uh, this is something that, that's me, that I own. Uh, and that when we begin to engage in these kinds of simple exercises to cultivate compassion, this um, network in the brain that is focused on the self, this, uh, the, the narrative network, begins to diminish in its activation. It begins to show different patterns of connectivity with other areas of the brain. And so it becomes, when, when I feel pain, it's no longer so much my pain. It's there, there I'm feeling sensations, I'm feeling heat, I'm feeling stretching. Uh, and it, the uh, self-identification really is diminished. And this is something that enables us to diminish this kind of self-focus and enable us to respond uh, in a more open, warm-hearted, and, and complete way to the suffering of others without getting ensnared by their suffering. Hello? Uh, I'm a quick clarifi clarification question. I'm a person who is very susceptible to um, uh, emotional contagions. If someone's nervous, I get nervous. If they're anxious, I get anxious. If I make them happy, I get very happy. Um, what is the correlation between emotional contagions and empathy? Well, uh, uh, according to some definitions, uh, Empathy really is, in many ways, emotional contagion. And I think in the sense that Paul was describing it, uh, at least in one sense that Paul was describing it, uh, the kind of emotional contagion that you're experiencing really is the experiencing of the emotions of another, which is one uh, key definition of empathy. Uh, and so I think that just from the way you talked about your own personal experience, I think it underscores the kind of limitations of empathy that Paul was, uh, uh, I think, so beautifully articulating. Yeah, I, 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 I similarly would characterize that what you have is an abundance of empathy. I think empathy is something else aside. Empathy could also be engaged by the imagination, by thinking of other people, by feeling their pain. Fictional characters, faraway characters, imagined situations. But certainly, if, if the presence of another person who's sad makes you sad, that's the purest case of empathy. It's what Adam Smith called sympathy. It's what most psychologists would call empathy. And it, it, and it has undeniable strengths in certain regards. But I think on, on balance, and I can say this because I have the same sort of issue sometimes, it's, it's a weakness. It, it, it would make, for instance, uh, I hope you're not a therapist, but make you a bad therapist because, because <laughs> if you're, this could be very embarrassing. Um, because, because if you're sitting across from someone who's extremely depressed, you'll get extremely depressed and it's difficult to do things. It also may, as in we talked, spoke about before, make it difficult for you to help people who are in true suffering because of the suffering caused by yourself. I mean, one thing that, that your comment, before I sort of get too down on what you're saying, um, empathy, I think, has other advantages um, that have nothing to do with morality. I think empathy makes us worse people. But empathy, for instance, can be a great source of pleasure. A lot of the pleasure we get from reading novels or watching movies or going to plays is empathic engagement with characters. I've lived some of the, the best moments of my life in the head of Walter White in Breaking Bad. Um, um, I, think, I think empathy is, is essential for certain sports. I think empathy is essential for certain intimate actions with those we care about. And so its problems are moral, but it does have other strengths in other domains. Hi, guys. First of all, thank you. This is one of the best panels I've been to. Um, thank you. Since we've thank been you. here, so thanks a lot. Uh, my question kind of goes with his. Where we have a five-year-old son who shows all, he's clearly empathetic. What do you do to help mend that lines Clearly, develop, can he's, he's very, he, has, he expresses a lot of empathy. I mean, the chocolate, the bear at the chocolate factory, he cries because he thinks the bear's sad. Like, he really feels other people's pain. So from a parent's perspective, what do you do 
to help direct them more in the way of compassion versus necessarily feeling everybody else's sadness or frustrations. Thanks. One of the things, it's a great question, and one of the things that we do as part of our kindness curriculum is that um, when, another per, when another child is sad in the classroom, for example, or um, has a fit of frustration, um, we uh, have the, the, uh, the, the child that we're working with, uh, we ask them how they think they're feeling, the other child, how it makes them feel, uh, but then also uh, what do you think can be done to help that other child, to relieve their pain? Is there anything that you think you can do to make Johnny feel better uh, and to shift the focus uh, from empathy to some kind of action that actually may relieve the suffering? So rather than wallowing in that empathy, uh, to transform it into compassion. And one of the questions which um, Paul and I have talked about in the past, but we haven't brought up here, uh, is whether there may be a, 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 at least a, an incipient form of empathy which is a necessary prerequisite for compassion. Uh, this is certainly not a question that we have any definitive evidence on in the scientific literature, but is an interesting question. Uh, and uh, in the case of, of children in this way, I do think we can use their empathic response as a jumping off point to then transform it into something different. Hi. Um, thank you very much again. It's a wonderful presentation and the uh, conversation has been excellent. Um, I, I wanted to say that I, want, I, um, I very much appreciate the, the rational approach where uh, we can think about uh, abstracting and uh, thinking about the larger picture and then also the effective uh, approach to this, they are two essential dimensions to human relationality. But it seems to me that uh, all of this is based in, uh, developmentally, in the early identification, attachment of folks to one another, infants to mothers and dads and that sort of thing, so that you have a fundament, an elemental fundament on which to build affective and the more rational uh, approaches to relationality. So I want to push this just a little bit. It seems to me that if we take that approach, then when the affective is particularly negative and we don't, we hate other people that are not like us and that the rationality is broken down because of our uh, negative disposition toward other people, then there are organizations that are stressing empathy as a way to get back to a, a form of engagement, a listening uh, engagement that tries to build understanding and then uh, develop a more, uh, develop effective, uh, uh, an effective approach that is more positive and we can think a, a bit more rationally. So that's, so I, I wanted to see about, so there's really no question, it's just, I'm throwing that at you, just saying it's a rehabilitation of empathy, but, but that's you, all. You, you've raised a lot of good points. I'll just respond to, to two of them, and we have about four minutes left, so I'll try to go quickly, and then maybe one more question, but, but and then Richie uh, would add, I'm spending time right now. Um, when, one thing is, I think the fundaments for what we're talking about, the foundations, don't necessarily come from any sort of early interactions. They come from being a mammal. I think a lot of them are just part of, part of our nature, part of our biological nature, that, that that more Darwin than Freud. Um, the, the second point is, we are talking, we, the conversation always comes back to feeling, as well it should, what role it plays and so on. But I think we should bear in mind that if I wanted to test people to figure out how likely you'd be to be violent, how likely you'd be not to help, how likely you'd be to be a bad person, both adults and children, the last thing I'd give you is an empathy test. No core, it wouldn't tell me nothing. But the first thing I would give you is a test of capacity and self-control rational engagement. Children's self-control at a young age has huge predictive power, more than just about anything we know for their future life. Another thing is intelligence. Those are powerful things for being a good person. Now, there's a lot of smart people with tremendous self-control who are real jerks, but 
for the most part, if I could bless my children through magic or genetic engineering traits, it would not be so much feeling as these, rather as these rational capacities. Well, I would just add that I think that, so I completely agree with Paul about the importance of particularly early self-control. The data really show quite convincingly that early self-control is a really important predictor of very significant adult life outcomes. Self-control, however, is not itself a rational um, activity. We can understand that it's important to control ourselves. That's not going to help us one smidgen to control ourselves. Uh, what helps is actually practice. Uh, and, and data show that we can actually improve self-control through that kind of practice. So we have time for one more quick question and a couple of quick answers. Um, right here. Um, my question is, I believe that empathy is absolutely necessary um, in our closest relationships. So I can think of an example if I get fired from my job, come home, and my partner is really um, compassionate. He gives me a back rub and uh, makes me a cup of tea, but he really doesn't get it. He doesn't get why I'm um, upset. Um, his compassion is almost useless to me if, if I don't feel understood. It's a great question. I'll give, I'll give my answer, which is that, that I appreciate what you're saying, but what you're really asking for, what you're really pointing out necessity of is compassion plus understanding. But suppose you feel humiliated. I don't think it's what you want or what you need for your partner to feel humiliated. Your partner wants, you want your partner to understand your humiliation and treat you with love and kindness. I think for your partner to feel humiliated would be the worst thing you'd want because now you have to worry about your partner's feelings. I agree, very strongly. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.